Greetings to all. I'm going to share with you this week's devotional. And we're going to be in Genesis looking at the story of Joseph, which occurs in chapters 37 through 45. If you have time this week, take time to read it. It's really a fascinating story. Now, R.T. Kendall wrote, If God puts his finger on you, it is enough to change you, your family, your church, even a nation or the world. The highest compliment a man can ever have is to be tapped on the shoulder by God. When that happens, wonderful things are at hand. Yet, it also means a time of preparation is at hand. This can also be called God's chastening. It is God's way of getting the man he owned ready for his own use. When God puts his finger on you, things may get worse before they get better. Hmm. I like the first part, don't you? I like the part about the power of positive change in me and my family or my church or even our nation and world. I like the compliment part to think that God would think so much of me to tap me on the shoulder. I like the wonderful things at hand part of the quote. R.T. Kendall should have stopped right there, right? But he couldn't if he was to be honest about how God works in preparing people. You know, preparation is everything. If you are painting, preparing the surface you paint will determine the outcome of your project. If you are a building, if you are building something or a builder, the time of planning and design, the foundation, the materials chosen make all the difference in the outcome and the longevity of the build. Even when you are a presenter, such as me, preparation is imperative. I had a professor in seminary who was not part of our denomination. He taught preaching and he would tell us that there was no possible way we could do justice to the, to the scriptures or to sermon writing and maintain three services a week. He knew in our denomination that we had a tradition of holding Sunday morning, Sunday evening, and Wednesday evening services, which meant three messages. The branch of Christendom that he was from only held Sunday morning services, and he would emphasize to us over and over again. 35 to 40 hours of preparation a week are needed to write and present an acceptable sermon. Now, to his credit, he was a master presenter. But the point is that he wanted us to understand that preparation was everything. The problem with preparation, it's the hard part. Throughout the Bible, we have stories recorded, records of people God used. Most all of them went through very trying times. Elijah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Peter and John, Paul, and of course, Jesus. One of the people that stand out is found very early in the account of God's relationship with the Hebrew people. In fact, it was so early that it comes way before the Hebrew people ever become a nation. And as we mentioned when we opened, his name was Joseph. I just read Joseph's story again. Two things struck me. One, it reminds me of the song that used to be a part of a country variety show called Hee Haw. Now, some of you may have never seen it, and some of you are afraid to admit that you watched it. I'll admit it, I did. The song went, gloom, despair, and agony on me, deep, dark depression, excessive misery. If it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. Gloom, despair, and agony on me. If you just look at the storyline of Joseph's, Joseph's life, there are several instances where the line, if it weren't for bad luck, I'd have no luck at all, would fit perfectly well. In fact, at times you could ask, is God really on Joseph's side? The second thing that struck me is that Joseph was confident in his place with the Lord. He never seems to question God regardless of what happened to him. He never seems to blame God or accuse God of putting him in such difficulty. Each time Joseph sinks deep into circumstances that are no result of his own doing, he doesn't blame God and God raises him up out of and above that circumstance. Regardless of the injustice suffered, Joseph doesn't lose faith. I need to be honest here and maybe you will feel the same as I do. When we walk through this story, I'm not always real strong on observation two, but I'm real good at observation one. In other words, there's probably a reason I remember the song, Gloom, Despair, and Agony on Me. I've felt that way a few times. How about you? 
And in those times, I haven't always been strong in faith. I've looked to the heavens and wondered where was God. I guess I need more preparation. Anyway, here's a taste of the life of Joseph. Joseph was from a large family of brothers. He was the youngest and was his daddy's favorite. Everybody knew that he was daddy's favorite. That fostered a little bit of sibling rivalry and sibling envy, to say the least. Early on, God gave him dreams, cueing him in on what was going to happen in his life. The dreams just happened to indicate that God had something special for Joseph. He would actually rule over all his older siblings. Well, Joseph told his brothers about the dream. It wasn't accepted very well, as you can imagine. He also told old dad about it, too, and dad basically said, keep it to yourself, son. Fast forward a little. Joseph is sent by his dad out to his brothers while they were watching the family flocks. The brothers, all jealous of him, plot to kill him. They've had enough of Joseph, and they've had enough of his dreams. A couple of them weren't keen on the idea, so they objected, resulting in a debate. At the end of the debate, a compromise of sorts took place, and they throw him in a pit. Eventually, they sell him to some traveling nomads who just happen to be cruising by on their camels. Now that they sold little brother off, they needed to come up with a story. So they took Joseph's fancy coat, which his dad had given him, and covered it with animal blood, and told old dad he was eaten by wild animals. No CSI in those days, no forensics, so dad buys the story and is heartbroken. So Joseph is sold into slavery by his brothers. That's a bad day. The nomads sell him again to an Egyptian official named Potiphar, and Joseph proves pretty smart with things. He proves to be a natural leader, a great businessman, and has wonderful logistic intuition. So Potiphar begins to profit because of Joseph's skills. God is blessing Joseph, and by blessing Joseph, he blesses Potiphar. So Potiphar puts Joseph over all his affairs, and Joseph increases Potiphar's wealth. Good day for all. Now, Joseph was a hunk. He was a young and strong and terribly handsome man. In my mind, he looked like a Hebrew Thor. Potiphar's wife can't keep her eyes off of him and tries several times to seduce him. Joseph, Joseph will have none of it. Then one day, when Joseph was working in the house and everyone else was gone but Potiphar's wife, she puts the move on him. When he rebuffs her verbally, because he will not betray Potiphar or God, she grabs him. He turns in a hurry and he runs away. And as he does, she rips the shirt right off his back. And in anger, because he refused her, she screams. When everyone came running to, to her aid, she accuses Joseph of sexual assault. The end result was he was imprisoned. A bad day and a bad place to be. Next comes the prison sagas. When in prison, he helps the jailer. The same abilities which prospered Potiphar prospers the jailer. God blesses Joseph and in doing so blesses the jailer. Guess what happens? You got it. Joseph gets put in charge of everything except his freedom, of course. So God raises up Joseph to leadership in the jail. Not great because you're in jail, but it could be worse. So kind of a good thing. Now, while in jail, Joseph runs into two of Pharaoh's servants who had obviously crossed the Pharaoh the wrong way and ended up in jail. They both have dreams, and Joseph interprets the dreams for them, of course, by God's help. Well, things came to pass exactly the way Joseph said they would. And for the servant whose dream had a positive result, Joseph asked him, don't forget me when you get back to Pharaoh in hopes that Pharaoh might release uh, Joseph. Well, guess what? It didn't happen. The guy is so excited about being reinstated to Pharaoh's service, just as Joseph said he would, that he forgets all about Joseph. Joseph doesn't cross his mind for the next two years. Wow, that's not a good thing. Well, two years later, Old Pharaoh has a dream, actually a couple of dreams, and no one can interpret them. Suddenly his servant remembers Joseph. Long story short, they gave Joseph a bath, 
They gave him a shave and a haircut, some new clothes, and march him in to see Pharaoh. Joseph, by God's help, interprets the dreams and also suggests that Pharaoh follow a certain plan. You see, the dreams revealed that there would be seven years of great prosperity followed by seven years of great famine. So Joseph suggested storing grain during the seven years of plenty so as to feed the people during the seven years of lean. So impressed was Pharaoh with Joseph that he snatched him out of prison and made him vice Pharaoh. He was over everything. Pharaoh even found him a wife. That's more than a good thing. That's a great thing. Life was really looking up for old Joseph. The only person more powerful than Joseph was Pharaoh himself. Talk about turning the tables. Okay, then the plot thickens. There were seven years of plenty and Joseph oversaw the storage of grain. Now the famine came and guess who gets hungry? You got it, Joseph's old family. So Joseph's dad hears that there is grain in Egypt to be had. So he sends the boys to Egypt to buy grain so they won't starve. The boys show up and guess who they have to ask to buy the grain from? You got it, Joseph. Now, Joseph recognizes them, but they don't recognize him. After all, he's all duded up as an Egyptian. Joseph immediately remembers all the pain they caused him. And as they tell their story, they reveal that there is a new younger brother at home and that dad is quite fond of him. So how does Joseph respond to the brothers who had betrayed him years before? He puts them in jail as spies. Then he has a change of heart and he releases all but one of them, demanding that the others bring back the younger brother as proof that they're not spies. Now, to be honest, in this part of the story, you can feel the internal tension within Joseph. One side of him wants payback and justice, and the other side wants to give grace and be united with his family. Through a series of twists and turns, Joseph finally reveals his identity to the brothers. He shows mercy on them and he says, don't be angry with yourself that you did this to me, for God did it. He sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives. These two years of famine will grow to seven, during which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God has sent me ahead of you to keep you and your families alive and to preserve many survivors. So it was God who sent me here, not you. And he is the one who made me an advisor to Pharaoh, the manager of his entire palace and the governor of all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and tell him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me master over all the land of Egypt. So come down to me immediately. You can live in the region of Goshen where you can be near me with all your children and grandchildren, your flocks and herds and everything you own. I will take care of you there. For there are still five years of famine ahead of us. Otherwise, you, your household, and all your animals will starve. I love the first part of R.T. Kendall's quote. I like the part about the power of positive change in me, my family, our church, even our nation or world. I like the compliment part of being tapped on the shoulder by God to think that God would think that much of me. I like the wonderful things at hand part of the quote. I would feel really good about the whole thing if R.T. Kendall would have stopped right there, but he couldn't if he was to be honest about how God works in preparing us. The rest of the quote is how we get to be what God can use. As he wrote, it also means a time of preparation is at hand. This can also be called God's chastening. It is God's way of getting the man he owned ready for his own use. When God puts his finger on you, things may get worse before they get better. There's a thread in Joseph's story. Take a look. From dad to brothers, from brothers to nomads, from mo nomads to Potiphar, from Potiphar to jail and a servant of Pharaoh's, from the servant to Pharaoh, from Pharaoh to governor, and as governor of Egypt, back to his family. You see, the entire thread 
is a threat of preparation. Each tragic circumstance, none of which were brought on by his own doing, placed him one rung higher to where God wanted to elevate him so as to use him in the history of his people. Joseph's family settled in Goshen, and there they prospered and multiplied until they became a great nation, the nation we know as Israel. As R.T. Kendall said, if God puts his finger on you, it is enough to change you, your family, your church, even a nation or the world. You know, I can't sit here and say that God caused the coronavirus, for example. I can't say that those that have lost their lives is a good thing. I can't say that those who may have lost their businesses is a good thing. I wouldn't do that. Just as I wouldn't say that selling Joseph into slavery was good or throwing him into prison was good. But what I can say is that God has an ability to take that which is evil and redeem it. And in the process, he prepares those who trust him. I can say he'll use it for good if we, like Joseph, will say yes. Yes to God and believe in him. God can use evil for good if we, like Joseph, will have confidence in him regardless of our circumstances. And who knows, in everything we've been through, who God just might tap on the shoulder.